Pass, take your seat, please. And uh, thank you very much to be here. And uh, so, so, thank you. May I ask you to stay up to uh, receive the jury? You are welcome. So sit down, please, thank you. And uh, you will continue this uh, session of the implication of corporate activities in and around settlements. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to, to uh, receive today, uh, because he's just coming back from Japan, our uh, jo Jose Antonio Martin Palin, Magistrado Emeritus a la dos del Corte Supremo de España. <laughs> Bienvenido. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, and Lord Anthony. Gifford will chair this uh, session of the first part of this afternoon. Thank you very much to you. I give you the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. We have started with the legal framework. We then went on to hear vivid testimonies of the human framework and the suffering involved by the illegal occupation and the settlements. We are now beginning to focus because it is very important for this tribunal that its work is focused and that what it recommends is direct and effective and can be implemented. So our first contributor is Ms. Adri Neuhoff, human rights advocate based in Switzerland. But I was very happy to hear from her, read from her profile, that she had been involved in the Holland Committee for South Africa. Uh, when I was involved with other people, comrades here in the anti-apartheid struggle, the Holland Committee for Southern Africa well, took the lead in effective boycott campaigns against the products of the Portuguese um, corporations in Angola and Mozambique. And so, and remember, the South African struggle resulted in democracy in South Africa. We have seen great things happen in our time, and we shall see more. Never despair. Adrian Newhoff. Wow. Sorry. Yeah. Well, now you know why I'm involved in <laughs> this type of uh, activity, holding companies uh, to account for their involvement in violations of international law. And um, I focus on uh, Veolia. The name is officially Veolia Environnement, uh, but I will use Veolia because Environnement all the time is a bit much. Uh, Veolia is a French transnational company. It operates in 70 countries, including in Israel. And um, it presents itself as one company. In 2005, they developed a strategy, a communication strategy, to show that all the companies they had with different names at that time became Veolia. So transport, waste, energy, and water. 
All companies carry the Veolia logo. All companies have the same code of conduct. The uh, revenues and profits are calculated as a whole. So to me, Veolia, I use Veolia either when it's Veolia transport in Israel or Veolia waste in Israel. Veolia is one company, it presents it as one company and I will address them as one company. Um, I have a machine. Ah, there it is already. Veolia. Uh, they are involved in the Jerusalem light rail. And uh, this project is part of the Jerusalem transport master plan that was developed by the municipality of Jerusalem and the Israeli government. And the uh, transport plan is really focusing on the Israeli point of view. In 2005, Veolia won the contract uh, as partner in the consortium CityPass that will, would construct the light rail and would operate the light rail. Veolia uh, in 2005 became for 5% owner of City Pass, and it won a 30-year contract to operate the first line of this plan. And as you can see on the map, the first line uh, links West Jerusalem. It goes up along the blue line, it's the red line, and then with a corner. Where it's like this, that's Shuafat, that's a Palestinian village and refugee camp in uh, the West Bank. In, um, then it goes to the right and up, and there are the settlements, French Hill and uh, Pisgat Zev. And in these two settlements, around 70,000 settlers live. So that's substantial. At the uh, ceremony for the signing, uh, the, con the signing of the contract, the then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he was present. It shows how important this project is. And he said the light rail will sustain Jerusalem for the Jewish people, will sustain Jerusalem, an undivided Jerusalem for the state of Israel. This is what the light rail is about. Um, Veolia uh, is not only involved in, in the light rail, it's also involved in running bus services which connect settlements in the West Bank with Isra communi Israeli communities in Israel. Oh, Hop. oh no, someone pushed it already for me. Wow, there's a picture, it says who profits on top. Uh, this, I work a lot with uh, my sisters from uh, the coalition and uh, so they help me in uh, getting those pictures. So they actually have pictures of the bus with the, Veo with the Connex logo, but Connex is owned by Veolia Transport, being part of Veolia Environnement. And the two bus, uh, the lines of the bus services are indicated and you can see that the settlements Beit uh, uh, Horon and Givat Zev are served by those bus services. And by its nature, it's only servicing Israelis, although the buses run in the West Bank. So it's discriminating against the Palestinian population in the West Bank, <coughs> discriminating in my definition and not the definition of Israel. No, it's, I'm okay. Um, the other activity uh, I'm doing myself, Veolia is also involved in waste management. Uh, they own uh, Tovlan landfill um, and in Tovlan landfill, waste is dumped 
from settlements uh, in the Jordan Valley. Toflan is in the Jordan Valley, in the West Bank. But not only from settlements, also from Israeli municipalities. So waste from inside Israel is dumped in the Jordan Valley. At a certain point uh, last year, Veolia claimed that uh, the Toflan landfill was no longer used. But uh, Corporate Watch, uh, a British uh, group really chasing companies for uh, violations of rights, they went to Toflan landfill and spoke to the worker who for 10 years now registers all incoming waste. And this worker said, no, it's still going on. And in April, he said, each day, six to 700 ton of waste was dumped in Tovlan landfill. And in fact, it had increased in 2010. And that was because one uh, Israeli municipality, Afula, with 40,000 inhabitants, is now dumping its waste in Tovlan landfill in the Jordan Valley. Um, there, we, to me, this tribunal is about what we as citizens, as civil society can do to hold companies to account where our governments are failing to intervene and to stop uh, violations of international law. And one of the tools in Europe is the EU Directive of 2004 on the procurement of public contracts. It gives authorities, local authorities, national authorities, the power to exclude companies which are involved in professional grave misconduct. And the way Veolia serves settlements, provides services to settlements, and in this way assists in maintaining the settlements, can be characterized as grave misconduct and is a reason to, uh, for a, a government, a local government, to exclude Veolia from bidding or it gives the power to not accept a bid. So there's a tool for us citizens, civil society. Um, I'm not going to repeat how settlements are, uh, that we've had that this morning. Is that okay, jury? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah? indeed. Please you want me to stop? No no, 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 I don't want you to stop. Sorry. No, no. Okay. Carry on. Is my time up? How no, many no, more? No, 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 no. <laughs> because, um, oh, thank you. All men are very friendly today. Um, discrimination. Veolia is, says it uh, practices non-discrimination. Well, the bus services are a clear example of how Veolia discriminates because it's only serving the Israeli population while it runs in the West Bank. There are other examples. In a way, the, the light rail also discriminates because in no way the needs of the Palestinian people in East Jerusalem or the West Bank has been taken into account when this uh, tramway was planned and designed. Um, furthermore, uh, in August, uh, advertisement appeared on television where Veolia was looking for new uh, personnel. And that was another example of discrimination because they, uh, job seekers were required to speak Hebrew or, and English, and they should have fulfilled the military service. And as we know, Palestinians are not called for military service. And more strikingly, 
Palestinians speak Arabic. So if the light rail route was planned to service Palestinians, at least it would be uh, important to have staff that speaks Arabic. So that should have been one. And another example why it really is not aiming to service Palestinians is the spokesperson of, of City Pass, the, the consortium that constructs and operates the light rail, Mr. Elian, when he was interviewed by a young Belgian researcher, he, I think he got a bit uh, carried away. And uh, he told her, well, the life patterns of Palestinians and Jews are so different, so if they would use the, the light rail, they wouldn't meet. And um, he added, but you know, there's a, a whole bus network that serves Palestinians. So to take into account the needs and to integrate the needs of Palestinians in the light rail is, was redundant. So Veolia really doesn't uh, live up uh, its uh, principles of non-discrimination. Now there's a letter, Veolia responded uh, to the tribunal. And I, I also would like to reflect on uh, this letter. Uh, I will read it. There, is, there was a lady who could show it. I need to take off my glasses at my age. What, strike, what, what really strikes me in the letter, it was said this morning, at all times we have sought to obey international law. And they should, because as uh, one of the partners in the UN Global Compact, they have promised to adhere to principles. And these principles include respect for human rights and international law. So if I read those words, the UN Global Compact is 2000, and they signed a contract in 2005. So I really don't, under, I would say this is nonsense. It's a cover-up operation. Yes, we can celebrate it, that we have at least something in hand to hold them to account because they, but they have had lots of opportunities to, to get out of, not to enter in this project <coughs> and to get out. And what I, they said, the changed circumstances in the region have also made managing this project even more complex and polemical. Changed circumstances, <laughs> no <laughs> occupation or what type of changes do they mean? But what really appalled me, the last sentence, mm -hmm. the story of these events illustrate just how difficult it is to deliver essential public services and thus to seek to contribute to a better living environment in disputed areas. 2010. They want to obey international law. After all those resolutions, after all the... Uh, I'm speechless, you know. This is, th these are the words of the Israeli government, and this is not what a company who says we want to obey international law. It really shows their true faith to me. For now. Thank you, and please stay at the platform. There may be questions. I was going to um, read the letter to the meeting, but I'm glad it was now on screen. I don't know whether it can be back on screen, um, because I was very anxious to have your reaction to it, since the tribunal has written to this and other companies and institutions who may be criticized, and when they write, their letters must be given uh, due recognition. Yeah. There was one other sentence that I wanted to ask you about in the second last paragraph. After talking about the changes becoming, making the project ever more complex oh, yeah. and polemical, they say this, at the same time, Veolia has been approached by a transport company and has decided to initiate the divestiture, means getting out of it, the divestiture of its interests in the project subject to fulfilling its contractual obligations. 
I'm glad it's back on screen so you can see the full subtlety of that sentence. Uh, but I would like to know whether you feel that this is the beginning of at least a partial victory or whether it is just going to mean that the project is taken over by somebody else. Oh, um, I, I would say that Veolia tries to sell off its, its shares in City Pass Consortium and its contract because it has become a burden to them. Mm -hmm. You know, actions in, in Europe, uh, they, they have lost contracts, their uh, image is damaged, so I can imagine they want to get out of it. They, there was a deal in principle last year with Danbus, and it didn't go through. And this time, it's with Egert, another Israeli uh, company. I don't think any European company wishes to take over Veolia share because they know what will happen. That's at least what we made clear. And with Egert, the deal is that uh, they will take over uh, the 5% uh, ownership in the consortium and the shares in to in the contract to run and operate the light rail, but over a period of five years. Mm -hmm. And if I'm correct, Mirab, when the light rail in these five years becomes more profitable, they will receive more money for the shares. So they're, they're in it for five years at least. Uh, questions from my colleagues? Mark Mansfield? Yes, um, it's on the same letter, so I, I, I'm glad it's still there. Just on that paragraph uh, Tony's been asking you about, yeah. Who, do we have any idea who the transport company is? Because I'm very suspicious of companies who have subsidiaries and they have a veil. And in fact, it may not be an independent transport company. It may be part of their group and they're covering it up. But do you know anything about that? Yeah, no, it's Egget and it's, uh, it's uh, a separate... Uh, it's separate. Yeah, it's not linked to Veolia. No, and it's not a cover-up. Right. Yeah. In the first paragraph, it ends with this sentence. We have always made it very clear that unless there was to be equal access by all, we would withdraw from the project. Now, that's quite plainly not happened. Yes. They must have known that it wasn't happening. So where is there any public statement by this company that that was a precondition for their involvement? I haven't read it. But um, they came up with uh, this argument when the pressure increased. That they said, we adhere to our principles of non-discrimination and they will be implemented also in the Jerusalem uh, light rail. But I don't know if it was a precondition on the contract. I would say it was not. Because it, I think Creolia didn't realize it's quite amazing for such a big company that they didn't realize w what type of project they were entering in. And one co could argue that uh, the French government maybe pushed them quite a bit to, to take on these contracts. Thank you very much and thank you. Okay. And I just, before you go, want to say that I think that what has happened and what is illustrated by this letter and the comments we've had on it shows that what we do has effects. We are not just writing letters and talking in the void to a blank wall. These people can be got at. Well, Companies can be influenced. Yeah, but Maybe yeah. belatedly, maybe after the end, too late. But we have power. Yes. That is why we are here to spread the amount of information that people have so that they can take more effective actions, bring yeah. more effective pressure on any company which is violating international That's law. That's true. If we work together, we can... Holland Committee on South Africa. Exactly. Take your glasses. Take your glasses. Take your glasses. I will. Thank you. I think it's very... It's, uh, the next speaker... Yeah, yeah. The next, yeah, you tell me. Yeah, we must announce that... Uh, the next speaker, Yaleb uh, Mashni from Palestine, 
is not here because he doesn't receive his visa. So, uh, Chair, we will have now uh, John Doman from Ireland. I think it's very good. Oh, sorry. Yes. John Doman, yes. So we will pass to the... No, no, John Doman. Yeah? Yes. John is here. He's coming. He's there. Yeah. He's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's there. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to introduce him. Uh, as you see, he is a, a human rights campaigner from Ireland. Um, again, veteran of highly effective campaigns, CND and Amnesty International, and now part of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. And I think in the light of what we said and heard about the last topic, it is very appropriate that he is to talk about us, talk to us about a company even closer to home, um, Cement Roadstone Holdings. Thank you, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Tribunal Jury, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Dorman. I'm a human rights activist based in Dublin, and I am the divestment officer for the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Today, I'm here to speak about an Irish, Irish construction materials company called CRH PLC. And it is my intention to draw several issues to the attention of the tribunal jury. It is my submission that CRH are in breach of the international guidelines on corporate responsibility. Furthermore, I intend to convince the jury that they are guilty of complicity with Israel's violations of international law. <coughs> In that regard, I will discuss the following issues. Firstly, I will outline the nature of CRH's involvement with the settlement industry and the construction of the separation wall in the occupied territories of Palestine. I will identify why CRH's activities are complicit with Israel's breaches of international law. Secondly, I will discuss two important internationally accepted frameworks on corporate responsibility. I will identify how CRH have failed their corporate responsibilities as set out in these guidelines. Finally, I will outline the nature of CRH's own code of business conduct, and I will identify their failure to comply with their own guidelines on ethics, on responsible business strategy, and the respect for human rights. To begin with, I'll give the jury a brief background on CRH itself. CRH is an international diversified building materials company with operations in 35 countries worldwide. CRH are the largest company quoted in the Irish Stock Exchange. In 2009, the, the company had sales of over 17 billion euro and returned profits of 598 billion euro. This would give you an idea of the size of this company. In 2001, CRH purchased 25% of the Israeli company Mashaf Initiative and Development Limited. Mashaf itself, which is a holding group, own Nesher Israel Cement Enterprises. Nesher are Israel's sole cement producer. They have a monopoly of cement. They sell 75 to 90% 90, 90 of all cement sold in Israel and in the occupied territories of Palestine. The use of Nesher cement has been well documented, this is the uh, Nesher logo here, well documented across many construction sites in the West Bank settlements, their infrastructure and in the construction of the Jerusalem Light Rail that Adri referred to earlier. In 2004, CRH admitted to Amnesty International that in all probability their cement is being used in the construction of the wall. Furthermore, the Mashif Group, through its subsidiary Nesher, has several other subsidiaries extensively involved in, the, in, the constru in construction activities. Nesher own 50% of Tavura, who wholly own Tashtit construction machinery. Tashtit itself are the sole importers of Lieber excavators and cranes. These, these excavators have been documented destroying Palestinian farms and olive groves uh, to enable the construction of the illegal separation wall. In this photograph here, uh, we have a, a Libra machine which is, is uh, demolishing farms 
in the Nalin area. These activities facilitate the continued ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from their land and the expansion of Israel's colonial <coughs> project in occupied Palestine. The construction of the settlement and their infrastructure is contrary to several articles of the Fort Geneva Convention. These constitute breaches of international humanitarian law. The International Court of Justice reaffirmed this in the 2004 advisory opinion on the wall and the settlements. The impact of the separation wall, which was very well illustrated by some of our speakers earlier, um, uh, the settlements and their infrastructure on the Palestinian people are contrary to the basic rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These constitute breaches of many provisions of international human rights law. Some of these breaches of international law constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. CRH, through their part ownership of Mashif, are complicit with these violations of international law. In 2006, the Divestment Task Force of the New England Conference of the United Methodist Church wrote to CRH, expressing their concern that the, company, the company's activities support in a significant way the occupation, Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. CRH's response was, they had no control over the end use of their products and they could not discriminate who they sold their products to. This clearly did not satisfy the task force ethical criteria and they put CRH on their divestment list. In March 2009, the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign wrote to the Chief Executive and to the Board of Directors requesting that they support and respect the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights within the company's sphere of influence. Let's remember, CRH have two out of eight of uh, the directors on the board of Mashif. This letter illustrates the nature of the human rights abuses which are occurring in the occupied Palestinian territories and the nature of CRH's complicity in those abuses. It put the company on notice of that complicity and invited them to divest from Mashif. In response, CRH claimed that they were aware of the responsibilities to, to um, respect human rights, but washed their hands of any responsibility for their subsidiaries' activities. It is our submission that CRH are fully aware of their complicity, and yet they continue to ignore and evade the responsibility for it. They continue to no ignore the requests of human rights and church organizations to divest from Mashif. And at this stage, it seems that the only way of encouraging CRH to divest from Mashif is by raising public awareness of CRH's illegal activities and encourage state, church, financial, trade unions, and other investors to divest from CRH. As a result, the IPSC have instigated a global CRH divestment campaign. And we welcome the decision by the United Methodist Church to divest from, from CRH and ASN Bank in Holland, who have also divested from CRH. And we hope that we will be able to spread this message right across as many countries as possible. I now refer to two key international frameworks on corporate responsibility. I will focus primarily on the United Nations Protect, Respect and Remedy Framework for Businesses and Human Rights. And I'll make reference to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. In 2005, the Secretary General of the United Nations appointed the Harvard professor, John Ruggie, as his special representative to clarify the roles and responsibilities of states, corporations, and other social actors in business and human rights activities. In 2008, Ruggie presented his report to the United Nations Human Rights Council, outlining a framework for business and human rights. He identifies three key, key, key principles which outline the duties and responsibilities which must be addressed in order to maintain and ensure compliance with national and international law. The first of these principles is the state's duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. This highlights that states have a primary role 
in preventing and addressing corporate-related human rights abuses. The second principle is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, which requires business to act with due diligence to avoid infringing the rights of others. The company's responsibility to respect human rights applies across its business activities and through its relationship with third parties connected with those activities. This implies that there is a direct corporate responsibility to comply with national and international law in respecting human rights. In order to discharge the responsibility, the company must engage in due diligence to prevent and address adverse human rights impacts. Due diligence consists of positive action by the company to ensure that business conduct does not contribute to human rights abuses. Companies should assess the risk of human rights abuses in countries where they operate on an individual basis and tailor their policies accordingly. They should assess what contributions their operations, whether as producers, service providers or employers, may make to human rights abuses. Complicity amounts to an indirect breach of human rights by the company through their action, inaction or association with the acts of third parties. Due diligence is required to prevent complicity. Ruggie's third principle is that companies must implement effective grievance mechanisms and access to remedies. The corporate responsibility to respect human rights requires a mechanism for remedy of the breach of those rights. The responsibility lies both with the company and the state to ensure that an effective grievance procedure, whether judicial or non-judicial, exists. The second framework is the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Ireland is a member of the OECD, as, as is Israel, uh, has become a recent member, um, which should be interesting. Uh, the guidelines are recommendations by governments covering all major areas of business ethics, including corporate steps to obey the law, observe internationally recognized standards, and respond to societal expectations. Two of the key policy states that enterprise should respect human rights by those affected by their activities, consistent with the host government's international obligations and commitments, and that they should encourage, where practical, business partners, including suppliers and subcontractors, to apply the principles of corporate conduct compatible with the guidelines. It is my submission that CRH have failed and neglected to comply with the UN framework and the OECD guidelines. They are guilty of failure to implement business practices with respect to international law accordance to the due diligence process. CRH have been put on full notice of their complicity with these human rights abuses. They have full knowledge of the nature of these abuses and have failed to take up positive action to prevent complicity. CRH have failed and continue to fail in their corporate responsibility to respect against human rights abuses in their business dealings. Their action and inaction makes a direct contribution to the perpetration of human rights abuses against the Palestinian people. That brings me to my third and final submission in, in relation to CRH's own code of business conduct. This code of conduct claims to ensure that the company have in place clear guidelines on business conduct and ethical behaviour. That's their quote. However, it is my submission that in fact CRH's code of business conduct fails to address these issues in relation to their investment with the Mashup Group. In line with John Ruggie's recommendations, CRH have a responsibility to assess the particular risks associated with operations in particular parts of the world. CRH's code of business conduct fails to do so. The code maintains that CRH supports the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a, insofar as applicable to our companies and that the group respects the protection of human rights within our areas of influence. Words. However, the code does not address the risk of breaches of human rights through investments such as their part ownership of this company, Mashav. While CRH profits from their subsidiaries' activities in the West Bank, they continue to maintain that they're a company who protects human rights. Clearly, this is not the case. It is submitted, therefore, 
that CRH's failure to address these issues amounts to a breach of, the, of their own guidelines and ethical code. CRH cannot continue to promote themselves as an ethically sound organization unless these issues are addressed. Meanwhile, their complicity continues. I call on the tribunal to urge the Irish government to take action against CRH to bring an end to their complicity. I call it on the tribunal to take action against CRH's unethical business conduct and irresponsible investment. I call on the tribunal to take action against CRH's complicity where they have failed to take action themselves. I call on this tribunal to make findings of guilt in relation to CRH's complicity with Israel's violations of human, human rights and international law in the occupied Palestinian territories. And finally, I call upon the tribunal to support the call for CRH to divest from Mashaf. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to highlight the shameful complicity of this Irish company in Israel's violations of international law. Thank you very much, John Dorman. Please stay at the platform. Um, the tribunal and the jury will make, give very, very serious consideration to this very well, um, this very excellent plea. Um, we wrote, the foundation wrote to CRS as it did to all companies, and if you heard, as you've heard, inviting their participation, and as you've heard, the earlier have replied in writing. The CRS, I will be corrected if I'm wrong, we have received nothing. Um, we invite CRS, if they are listening over the internet to these proceedings, to submit anything they wish to say in comment or response to what John Dormer has said to this tribunal before it completes its de deliberations. Uh, on the same theme, I just wanted to ask John whether he had, he and his organization had any, had any response from CRS to the letter which they wrote in March of this year, or indeed whether he's aware of any other statement by CRS in response to these charges which are made against them. Yes, they did respond, and they responded in much the same manner as they responded to the United Methodist Church, saying that they can't uh, discriminate um, against um, any, any group as to where they're, who they sell their, their cement to. Um, and that's, that's, that's the essence of their answer, and then they, they would also make reference to Ruggie, I think in part because we made reference to Ruggie, um, and we're very selective in, in one of the, in, in the response to that. Um, but we, we would still put it back in their court that they have an obligation in terms of due diligence. They know what's happening there. They know where the cement is going. They know that they're making profits. Um, and they shouldn't be there. When you started to say can't discriminate, I thought you were about to say can't discriminate against Palestinians. They didn't say that. No, they didn't. They're quite happy to sell cement to the Palestinians as they are to the Israelis. Or to the um, Israelis for the... But it may, be, it may be a case that uh, the Palestinians uh, may not have any other option where they buy, might buy their cement. Um, colleagues? Um, yes, John. Um, I've got a series of questions because you're asking us uh, quite rightly to make findings of, of guilt in relation to this particular case. Now, if we're, we're going to do that, then uh, I'd be grateful for some assistance in, with regard to the actions of this company. So I'm going to start with this question. Um, I think you said that there are two directors of this Irish company that are also on the board of one of the Israeli companies. That's correct. And in fact, the company you named... <coughs> Uh, unless I misheard you, was Mashaf? Or are they also directors of another subsidiary, Nesha? Um, my understanding is that they have two directors on the board of Nesha, because Mashaf is a holding group. Right. So then they're entitled, they have a 25% stake, so they're entitled to have two board directors. Right, so the question of, first of all, knowledge it's not just a general question that they will have read it in a newspaper. They're actually sitting on the board 
of one of the companies that is in fact manufacturing the cement. That's correct. So either they do actually know or should know. So there's no question about that. Is that um, right? Yeah, that's correct. Now, second question. Do we know who those two, two directors are? Yeah, we do. Oh, could you kindly name them, please? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I don't have the names to hand. But I do know who they are, and I can supply you with that information. Would afterwards. you be kind enough to let us know who they are? Uh, if they're watching, they'll know who they are. And I'd be very, uh, we would be very grateful for any, as Tony said, any response from them. But just going on from the question of knowledge, it also in, can be readily inferred if they're sitting actually on the board of the company taking these decisions, that they have a management and control role. Absolutely. Right. Now, I want to just pursue it a little further. Have there been, in Ireland, any challenges to this situation, either at the level of the Irish government or the company itself? Legal challenges? No, there haven't. Um, and uh, some members of the Irish Parliament at all have raised questions about CRH. Um, and their activities in, in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. And uh, interestingly enough, the response that comes back from, um, from the minister is it's like he is taking a press release from CRH itself. Well, uh, in that context, uh, I, I hope everyone here will forgive me for a moment. One of the most, you've mentioned it in passing, that is the the ICJ, a World Court decision, on the wall in 2004. Now, that uh, was a, a, a dramatic watershed decision which not only held that there were uh, severe breaches of human rights law and international humanitarian law, an overwhelming judgment, 13 to 1. There is a particular paragraph, and I'm going to cite it so the company, if they're listening, can go back and have a look at it themselves. It's paragraph 159 of their judgment. And it brings in the Irish government as well as the company itself and the guidelines you've mentioned. And I'm going to read it because it's so important and I'm sure you're aware of it. So everybody here knows exactly what the World Court has said about this situation in unequivocal terms. Given the character and the importance of the rights and obligations involved, the court is of the view that all states and can I interpose, it means all states, whether they're parties or not, are under an obligation not to recognize the illegal situation resulting from the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territory, including in and around East Jerusalem. They're also under an obligation not to render and or assist in maintaining the situation created by such construction, as we saw in the film before lunch, it is also for all states, while respecting the United Nations Charter and international law, to see to it that any impediment resulting from the construction of the wall to the exercise by the Palestinian people of the right to self-determination is brought to an end. It goes on. Now, those are fairly clear terms, are they not? They are, yep. Right. Now, the first thing at one level is uh, has there been any approach to the ICC or any other international uh, organization or tribunal, to be more precise, to in fact see if this can be carried through in the case of the Irish government? Not, not that I'm aware of. Right. So we, we could be in a position Absolutely. to petition the ICC to have a look at this, since in fact it's the ICJ who are passing judgment on this. The second thing is, of course, is that the Irish government under this have a very clear obligation uh, and they plainly haven't fulfilled it. So the second level is we could petition the Irish government to get on with it straight away. No question about that. That's their obligation. Yes. And of course, they, if they're listening to this internet broadcast or any part of them are listening to it or get to hear of it, uh, they, could, they could take action in the way the Dutch government did in an entirely separate case. In other words, tomorrow morning they could raid the offices of this company and confiscate their computers. Is that right? Yeah, and I'd certainly encourage it. <laughs> uh, can you do, I think you know a little bit about the Dutch case. Do you? Sorry, I've got one more question. No, no, um, okay. 
John has a different case. Yes, so okay. We'll leave that not to mention the Dutch case. Now, the Dutch case, uh, one of our panel is withdrawing for the second, so it's made clear uh, because of interest in that case. So I don't go further than that. But I just, uh, a synopsis of the case, if you wouldn't mind, just so the facts of what has happened in that case so far. I'm sorry, my, my, my knowledge is very scant on, on, on that case. Um, uh, the name of the company is uh, Rewa, who are um, who have cranes, who they, and these cranes have been documented um, in the construction of the wall. Um, and I know that, uh, and as far as I, I, as far as I know, two two years ago, um, they were warned about um, um, any carrying out any activity because the wall is illegal, um, and yet they continued, and that resulted in the the raid of their offices. Um. Now that, that's at the level of the Irish government. Then of course, coming down an, a level again, those people who have been affected by the building of the wall, and it's obvious who, who they are, the people who are living in and around, and in fact covered a much bigger area, a whole hinterland in relation to the wall. Under, as far as, I, I don't know whether you're able to answer this, but under Irish law, is there provision for such people, should they be able to come within the terms of Irish law, to sue the company in Ireland? I, I'm afraid I you can't, can't answer, I can't answer right. that question. Have there been any cases mounted of that, that kind? Not that, not that I'm aware of. All right. Mm -hmm. John it's made second. such good submission, you might think he's a lawyer, but he's not. No. <laughs> he made a better submission than a lawyer might make. Um, and I, I, I do have the names of the um, two directors who hopefully are tuned in today. Um, it's a, one guy is the corporate manager of CRH and his name is Martin McOda. And the second guy is um, cement operations manager for Europe Materials Division of CRH. Um, and Israel is in the Europe Materials Division um, as they are in, in um, the Eurovision. Um, and his name is John, John Madden. Pardon me, could you yeah. say those names again? John, John Madden okay. and Martin McOda. Oda. Sorry, I'm not pronouncing it very well, but I can give you the... We'll get, we'll get the precise yeah. name for you. Um, and and just, just to say that um, CRH would continue to say that they're a minority shareholder and have... Uh, and don't have any input in the day-to-day -day operations. John Norman, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now officially finishing the second section, which was entitled Implications of Corporate Activities in and Around Settlements. And we are beginning the third section headed trade and labeling of, sep of settlement goods, coming down even closer to the issue of goods and no doubt um, advice on possible action that people can take. We're going to have one presentation on this topic before we go to the break from Salma Kami. She is a barrister at Chambers in London here, uh, but she is also a legal researcher and I think is speaking on behalf of the Palestinian human rights group, uh, human rights organization, Al-Haq. In welcoming her, I would like to recognize the work of Al-Haq. Uh, those of us who have comfortable practices in London or even Jamaica uh, must recognize that human rights lawyers in Palestine and in other places uh, literally put their lives and liberty on the line. Very happy to welcome Salma Khan. Uh, thank you very much. I've been introduced, but uh, my name is Salma Kami, a barrister in England and Wales and a legal researcher at the moment at Al Haq. And I'm meant to be addressing, addressing you on the issue of uh, settlement produce, but just before I do, uh, because the previous uh, witness was asked about um, the Dutch company um, that there's been action against, I was hoping to just use half a minute to be able to tell you a bit about the case because uh, it resulted from a criminal complaint that was lodged by al Haq in conjunction with a Dutch lawyer against uh, the company. Uh, the company is called Rual. It's a Dutch uh, private rental company and has been supplying mobile cranes and aerial platforms 
for the construction of the wall in the West Bank. And uh, in summary, there was uh, some public campaign against uh, the company when it was discovered that it was renting its uh, equipment for the wall back in 2006. And uh, the Dutch government approached the company and asked them about their uh, activities. Initially, they tried to deny their involvement by saying that the company in charge of the supply was in fact an Israeli company. Uh, that was discovered to be incorrect and it became apparent that it was a Dutch company which was involved in the supply. Then uh, the company was approached again and said that it had stopped supplying its cranes, but a year later it was found uh, that its equipment was still being used for the construction of the wall. Uh, and eventually, as I've said, a criminal complaint was lodged, lodged with the public prosecutor in Holland, uh, alleging that the company is complicit in war crimes, uh, which result from the construction of the wall, in particular the unlawful destruction of land, uh, the crime of apartheid and persecution of the Palestinian population. And as a result, the prosecution in Holland has opened an, an investigation which resulted in the raid of the company's offices a few weeks ago in Holland. So that's where we've got to with that. If I could now turn to the subject matter of my address to the tribunal. I was asked to uh, um, address you on an overview of legal issues resulting from the trade and production of settlement goods, which is a very broad topic. So if I may, I will just focus on one particular angle, uh, which is the question of whether the production and trade of settlement goods that involves the extraction of natural resources from the West Bank could amount to the war crime of pillage by those involved. In my written evidence, I've also addressed the question of whether the production of settlement produce could somehow be considered to aid and abet the transfer of Israel's civilian population to the West Bank. But I don't think I'll have time to look at that second issue in my address to you today. So just focusing on the first issue, which is that of the war crime of pillage, uh, what I propose to do is to go through the uh, prohibition against pillage and the, the elements of the crime in theory and then to attempt to apply those elements to a particular factual, factual situation, which is the activities of a company at Harvard, which extracts mud and minerals from the Dead Sea in the occupied West Bank. And I'm aware from the agenda that I think you have two witnesses who will address you about the Harvard in later this afternoon, so perhaps their evidence can supplement what I have to say. Just Briefly, by way of introduction, the legal framework, which I think is now well known and well rehearsed, is that of international humanitarian law, uh, in particular the Fourth Geneva Convention and the Hague Regulations. They regulate the behavior of the occupying power, Israel, in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. And in particular, they protect property against unlawful appropriation. So it's going to be the provisions of international humanitarian law to which I refer. So looking first then at the, the prohibition against pillage and what pillage means, it's explicitly prohibited in the Fourth Geneva Convention and the Hague Regulations and is defined as the appropriation of private or public property in the context of armed conflict or occupation without legal justification. So what does this essentially mean if we look, try to break down the crime into its various elements? Uh, we would have to have an appropriation of property by a perpetrator uh, without the consent of the owner of that property without justification under particularly the Hague regulations which allow the appropriation of property in certain very limited instances. And the conduct has to take place in the context of an armed conflict or an occupation. So I'll go very briefly through these elements if I can. Appropriation um, is understood to mean both the di direct appropriation, i.e. the taking of something, so that could involve the extraction of natural resources, for instance, from, from the soil or from the land, but also importantly, has been interpreted to mean also the, an indirect appropriation in the sense of the receiving of goods or the purchasing of goods which have been unlawfully appropriated to begin with. And the importance of this can't be overstated because when we look at commercial transactions um, in relation to settlement, produce and trade, it means that those further down the supply line could technically be implicated in an appropriation through their receipt uh, of goods which have been unlawfully taken. We need also to have a lack of consent of the owner of the property. And it, this, this means knowing or having to determine the ownership of the property in question. 
In the case of natural resources, which is what I wanted to focus on, we're normally looking at state-owned property as opposed to privately owned property. And in that case, it's not so much the consent of the owner or the lack of consent of, of the owner which needs to be established, but rather uh, a use or an exploitation of those resources in a way which breaches uh, the provisions of international humanitarian law, in particular what are known as the rules of usufruct. And they're quite complicated, but they boil down essentially to the proposition that an occupying power such as Israel is allowed to extract and exploit natural resources but must apply the proceeds of that extraction to uh, the local population, to the cost of administering essentially the occupation for the benefit of, of the local people and not for its own private gain, not in order, for instance, to finance its war effort or to enhance its civilian economy. Uh, we also have to have an appropriation committed in the context of of armed conflict or occupation, and in the case of uh, Israel and Palestine and settlement produce, this isn't, this isn't a difficult element to establish. In terms of the mental element, looking at what a perpetrator who's committed pillage needs to, uh, needs to know or intend, as a general rule, um, taken at its highest, one would expect um, that the perpetrator has to have acted with intent and knowledge. That means they have to mean to appropriate the property or extract the natural resources in the knowledge that um, essentially either the owner doesn't consent to that appropriation or in the case of state-owned property, as I alluded to, that the, these rules of usufruct are being breached, i.e. the proceeds are not going to the local Palestinian populace but are, are being used for other purposes. And in addition, the perpetrator has to be aware essentially that, that there's an armed conflict or occupation. So those are the elements of, of pillage that I've tried to run through very, very quickly in theory. Uh, and I want to now apply those elements to a specific situation which I have said uh, at the start, and that is Ahava's um, activities in the West Bank. Uh, I, am, I am sure that many of you will be aware um, of a company, an Israeli company called Ahava, uh, according to information that I've managed to obtain from Who Profits and from some other internet sources, um, Ahava Dead Sea Laboratories is the full name of the company. It's a privately owned uh, Israeli company based in uh, an Israeli settlement called Mitzpah Shalem, which is uh, near to the Dead Sea in the occupied uh, section of the Dead Sea. And it produces cosmetics that contain minerals and mud which are extracted from the shore of the, of the Dead Sea in the occupied section. As I understand it, there is some uh, disagreement or some dispute over this particular aspect of whether or not the resources are extracted from the occupied uh, shore or from the part of the shore which falls within Israel proper. Obviously, that particular element is absolutely crucial to making out a case of pillage against, uh, against a harbor. But as I understand it, there is credible um, objective information that says that the extraction of the resources is taking place in the occupied section of the Dead Sea. So it, it produces cosmetics from these uh, minerals and this mud and exports those cosmetics to Israeli and Western markets. Uh, and it has several distributors, um, or it, they may be subsidiaries, I'm not entirely sure of the relationship with the parent company, in other countries, including here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and another important point, perhaps uh, not so much for, the, for pillage, but for other aspects of potential liability, is that the, um, the company... Um, Part of the company's shares are actually owned by two Israeli settlements in the West Bank, uh, Mitzvah Shalem and another settlement called Kalia. Uh, and it's also known that uh, the factory of Ahava employs residents of those settlements to work in it. And apparently um, the settlement's websites actually advertise uh, Ahava as being one of the employment opportunities for the residents there. So if I turn now to ask the question, do Ahava's activities fulfill or potentially fulfill uh, the crime of pillage? Or do they constitute the crime of pillage? I look first at whether essentially I'll go through the elements that I've already outlined, the, the actus reus, which is the act of pillage, and, and the mental elements to see whether there could be a potentially liability there. Now, in terms of first, there needing to be an appropriation of property, or in this case, natural resources, it would appear that uh, Ahava and Israel uh, at least, I mean, those persons who represent Ahava are involved in the extraction of minerals from, from
from, the, from occupied territory in the sense that they, they physically take minerals and mud from the shore of the Dead Sea, or they order that taking and, and organize for it to be done. A harvest distributors in other countries could potentially be caught under the provision of indirect appropriation in the sense that they, they appear to receive that, those natural resources in the form of cosmetics and go on to market and sell them. Um, a lot will depend on, on sort of the, the relationship, I think, between the parent, the harbor and Israel and its subsidiaries in determining the extent of uh, the other company's uh, involvement. Uh, does the appropriation take place in the context of occupation or armed conflict, which is another requirement? Uh, I think this one is quite easily fulfilled in that the company is extracting resources from territory that's under military occupation, uh, and there's the necessary uh, connection uh, there with, with armed conflict or occupation. I think the fact that a harbor is based inside an Israeli settlement heightens uh, that connection also. Finally, we look at the question of the ownership of resources and whether there's a breach of uh, the Hague regulations and the way that these natural resources are being exploited. Uh, in terms of ownership of resources, it's factually quite complicated uh, in the West Bank because there are a myriad of laws in place from Ottoman times which determined how land uh, or natural resources are owned. But in, in all probability, there needs to be a bit more research on this, but in all probability, it's either going to be considered that the land uh, of the Dead Sea shore from which the minerals are being extracted or the minerals and mud themselves are essentially in some sort of public ownership or state ownership rather than in private ownership. So then we need to look at whether the extraction of these resources breaches these rules of usufruct to which I referred. Are they going to benefit the local Palestinian population or are they going to benefit um, private Israeli interests? And it's quite clear in, in this case that uh, the extraction is taking place in the context of an Israeli private enterprise and therefore the rules of usufruct are breached and the, the exploitation in that sense is unlawful. Um, in terms briefly then of the mental element of pillage, which is what would need to be established for particular persons within the company uh, to be found uh, guilty of the war crime. As I've said, taken at its highest, and there is some indication that this is in fact, uh, there is in fact a lower standard, but I'll, I'll take it at its highest. Intention and knowledge of the factual circumstances would need to be made out against the, uh, the representatives or employees. Uh, we know that um, Ahava's employees in Israel, especially its um, senior management, would appear to be responsible for the purposeful extraction of the minerals from the Dead Sea. Uh, and they would appear to, to know that those minerals are coming from occupied territory and the proceeds are not being applied to the local Palestinian population. <coughs> And this is particularly the case. I mean, this is something which I believe can be inferred from the circumstances. I mean, it's not conceivable that a company like a harbor, which is actually based in a settlement, isn't aware of the factual circumstances surrounding the extraction of resources for which it's responsible. But we also know, and this becomes perhaps more relevant for senior harbor representatives abroad in these, in these distributor or subsidiary companies, that there's been a, a very... Um, there's been a public campaign against Ahava's activities and the CEOs, as I understand it, of Ahava Israel and Ahava United Kingdom and perhaps Ahava in the United States have actually been written to and complaints have been made about their activities. And in that way, one perhaps could also infer their knowledge. Uh, and so in conclusion, uh, it, I believe it's possible to say that the, the war crime of pillage might be capable of being made out against specific persons within uh, the Harvard company or, within, or against a Harvard itself as an entity, as a company. Uh, clearly, some elements of it need further research, but that is sort of the skeleton framework in which we could um, view their, their liability. And I think the same reasoning could be applied to a number of other Israeli companies which are involved in the extraction of uh, natural resources from the West Bank. For instance, those are, who are involved in quarrying uh, those involved in, as well, potentially the production of agri agricultural produce, uh, such as dates and flowers and herbs that we've, that we've heard about. So given, given the time restraints, I think I'll keep it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Please wait a moment on the platform.
Uh, I like the way that some of these old conventions call things by their proper name without any euphemisms. The word pillage. I mean, when we listened to the speaker who couldn't get here from Palestine talking about what happened to his farm, that was pillage. And it's good that the law can sometimes call things by its proper name. So my only question really, and you began to touch on it, as a lawyer and an activist, would you agree that the way forward on issues like Ahava lies in a combination of sound legal research and popular action and pressure? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think sound legal research, which leads potentially to litigation against these companies, can very well supplement uh, campaigns which are conducted against them and w which may not always be effective in, in making them stop their activities. And at the same time, those campaigns can supplement cases which could be brought because we derive a lot of our information about the company's activities from the act of, of these campaigns which, which force them to make responses or to um, address um, those that complain against them. Thank you. Colleagues. Cynthia. It, it is true that universal jurisdiction is unfortunately uh, becoming less universal, as you've put it, because of the actions of, of governments and changing their laws. I, I think, unfortunately, those who've brought the, those cases have, have become the victims of their own success. That, in a sense, it's the fact that the cases got as far as they did, which caused tremendous pressure uh, and meant or enabled the government to change laws to restrict their application. And that's why, uh, I mean, I personally am particularly interested in instances in which um, you have companies or individuals who are domiciled or residents of uh, countries outside of Israel and Palestine and in which jurisdiction can be asserted not on the basis of universal jurisdiction but some other link such as usually through the, the defendant being resident or domiciled. So I gave the example of Ahava having this distributorship or, or subsidiary in the United Kingdom, which is a UK company domiciled here, um, would potentially be able to afford us that foothold in terms of jurisdiction. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be thought about m more um, by those who are interested in bringing cases in order that we don't continue, I suppose, to perhaps weaken what's qu becoming a more and more fragile mechanism of universal jurisdiction. Good. Well, that's been, thank you very much, uh, Salma. It's been an excellent session. We are now going to break uh, for a tea break, coming back at 16.30, half past four. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bank and um, then it goes to the right and up, and there are the settlements, French Hill and uh, Pisgah Zev. And in these two settlements, around 70,000 settlers live. So that's substantial. At the uh, ceremony for the signing, uh, the con the signing of the contract, the then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he was present. It shows how important this project is. And he said the light rail will sustain Jerusalem for the Jewish people will sustain Jerusalem, an undivided Jerusalem for the state of Israel. This is what the light rail is about. Um, Veolia uh, is not only involved in, in the light rail, it's also involved in running bus services which connect settlements in the West Bank with Isra communi Israeli communities in Israel. Oh, Hop. oh no, someone pushed it already for me. Wow. There's a picture, it says who profits on top. Uh, this, I work a lot with uh, my sisters from uh, the coalition and uh, so they help me in uh, 
getting those pictures. So they actually have pictures of the bus with the, Veo with the Connex logo, but Connex is owned by Veolia Transport, being part of Veolia Environnement. And the two bus, uh, the lines of the bus services are indicated, and you can see that the settlements Beit uh, Horon uh, and Rivat Zev are served by those bus services. And by its nature, it's only servicing Israelis, although the buses run in the West Bank. So, Ask, take your seat, please. And uh, thank you very much to be here. And uh, so, so. Thank you. May I ask you to stay up to uh, receive the jury? You are welcome. So sit down, please, thank you. And uh, you will continue this uh, session of the implication of corporate activities in and around settlements. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to, to uh, receive today, uh, because he's just coming back from Japan, our uh, jo Jose Antonio Martin Palin, Magistrado Emeritus a la dos del Corte Supremo de España. <laughs> Bienvenido. Welcome. And uh, and Lord Anthony. Gifford will chair this uh, session of the first part of this afternoon. Thank you very much to you. I give you the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. We have started with the legal framework. We then went on to hear vivid testimonies of the human framework and the suffering involved by the illegal occupation and the settlements. We are now beginning to focus because it is very important for this tribunal that its work is focused and that what it recommends is direct and effective and can be implemented. So our first contributor is Ms. Adri Neuhoff, human rights advocate based in Switzerland. But I was very happy to hear from her, read from her profile, that she had been involved in the Holland Committee for South Africa. Uh, when I was involved with other people, comrades here in the anti-apartheid struggle, the Holland Committee for Southern Africa well, took the lead in effective boycott campaigns against the products of the Portuguese um, corporations in Angola and Mozambique. And so, and remember, the South African struggle resulted in democracy in South Africa. We have seen great things happen in our time, and we shall see more. Never despair. Adri Neuhoff. Wow. Yeah. Well, now you know why I'm involved in <laughs> this type of uh, activity, holding companies uh, to account for their involvement in violations of international law. And um, I focus on uh, Veolia. The name is officially Veolia Environnement, uh, but I will 
use Veolia because environment all the time is a bit much. Uh, Veolia is a French transnational company. It operates in 70 countries, including in Israel. And um, it presents itself as one company. In 2005, they developed a strategy, a communication strategy, to show that all the companies they had with different names at that time became Veolia. So transport, waste, energy, and water. All companies carry the Veolia logo. All companies have the same code of conduct. The uh, revenues and profits are calculated as a whole. So to me, Veolia, I use Veolia either at when it's Veolia transport in Israel or Veolia waste in Israel. Veolia is one company, it presents it as one company and I will address them as one company. Um, I have a machine, ah, there it is already, Veolia. Uh, they are involved in the Jerusalem light rail and uh, this project is part of the Jerusalem Transport Master Plan that was developed by the municipality of Jerusalem and the Israeli government. And the uh, transport plan is really focusing on the Israeli point of view. In 2005, Veolia won the contract uh, as partner in the consortium City Pass that will, would construct the light rail and would operate the light rail. Veolia uh, in 2005 became for 5% owner of City Pass and it won a 30 year contract to operate the first line of this plan. And as you can see on the map, the first line uh, links West Jerusalem, it goes up along the blue line, it's the red line, and then with a corner, where it's like this, that's Shuafat, that's a Palestinian village and refugee camp in uh, the West. It's discriminating against the Palestinian population in the West Bank, <coughs> discriminating in my definition and not the definition of Israel. No, I'm okay. Um, the other activity uh, I'm doing myself, Veolia is also involved in waste management. Uh, they own uh, Tovlan Landfill. Um, and in Tovlan Landfill, waste is dumped from settlements. Uh, in the Jordan Valley, Toflan is in the Jordan Valley, in the West Bank, but not only from settlements, also from Israeli municipalities. So waste from inside Israel is dumped in the Jordan Valley. At a certain point uh, last year, Veolia claimed that uh, the Toflan landfill was no longer used. But uh, Corporate Watch, uh, a British uh, group really chasing companies for uh, violations of rights, they went to Tovlan Landfill and spoke to the worker who for 10 years now registers all incoming waste. And this worker said, no, it's still going on. And in April he said, each day, six to seven hundred ton of waste was dumped in Tovlan landfill. And in fact, it had increased in 2010, and that was because one uh, Israeli municipality, Afula, with 40,000 inhabitants, is now dumping its waste in Tovlan landfill in the Jordan Valley. Um, there, to me, this tribunal is about 
what we as citizens, as civil society can do to hold companies to account where our government